thank you to Prostate Cancer Canada for invitation to present uh, work in this exciting area of epigenetics and some research that we have been performing in my lab along with uh, some other collaborators, both nationally and internationally. So we um, will start with my presentation. Uh, the uh, title, as you can see, is Epigenetic Biomarkers. Uh, which are promising tools for prostate cancer. And I would like to focus today's presentation on four major areas. First, I would like to describe what is epigenetics. Then I would like to discuss interplay or interactive um, uh, environment in which epigenetics and genetics connect with each other. I would like to then describe how epigenetics and environmental influences that surround us play a major role in regulating each other. And then I would like to move on to describe what is meant by a biomarker and then specifically focus on epigenetic biomarkers. And then finally, I would like to bring all this together by discussing how these epigenetic biomarkers will help prostate cancer patients. So as you can see, epigenetics as a definition really originates from the Greek origin of epi, which is upon, genesis, which is generation or birth or origin. And in other words, it's really genes, which are the small units that carry genetic information in our body. And that is also is uh, equivalent to being born. So Dr. Waddington, whose picture you can see on the right hand side, was a British scientist who in 1942 actually published what is considered to be a seminal observation or paper that came up with this concept or definition of epigenetics. And the way he described it is it is the interaction of genes with their environment which brings the phenotype into being. Phenotype is the outwardly physical traits or characteristics that we all display. But those are being driven and are regulated by interaction between these genes with the environment that surrounds us. But it is being mediated through these epigenetic mechanisms. So epigenetics, although it was originally defined in 1940s, its potential and promise to treat different diseases became a major focus of research only in the past 15 or so years. And the emerging importance of epigenetics was actually seen even eventually by the mainstream media. As you can see here, for example, one of the earlier mention in the mainstream media was looking at epigenetics with a rather catchy name calling ghost in your genes. And as you can see there, epigenetics was described based on scientific evidence that had started to emerge as being hidden influence upon the genes, which can act, really have impact on every aspect of our life. Now, if you look at further on, five, say five years fast forward, in 2010, Time magazine actually published a special issue on epigenetics and actually tried to show why your DNA isn't your destiny. So DNA that you are born with, genes that you carry, can actually be influenced or modified further by influence of epigenetics. And as rightfully it says, the caption underneath, that epigenetic marks will tell your genes to switch on or off, which is a very important concept that I'll come back to, or speak loudly or whisper. So really in this context, you can picture epigenetic mechanisms as entering in a room and trying to switch a light switch on or off. That would be the influence of epigenetics on genes to be expressed or not. You can also sometimes, when you enter a room, could have a dimmer put on a light switch. So you can just dim the lights, but not completely switch them off. And again, epigenetic mechanisms can have that influence on how genes are expressed. And then you can see this is a picture of twins. As you can see, these are identical twins. And National Geographic had a very interesting article describing different 
uh, pairs of such identical twins. And as you can see, it's being called alike, but not alike. And that's because even though you can see at the first glance that these are identical twins, at close inspection, you can also see that they show subtle but definitely discernible differences. And those differences are being brought upon by epigenetic mechanisms that are acting on the background of identical genes in these identical twins. So with that, I would actually like to now move on to talk about the three major types of epigenetic mechanisms. These are listed here as DNA methylation which is addition of a methyl group, a type of methyl mark, which is also called either as a short form as M or ME, which is put upon the DNA sequence. And that eventually will control how that gene is being expressed. There is also another type of mechanism called small non-coding RNAs. And today I'm going to particularly focus on microRNAs which are also known as miRNAs as a short form. And these actually bind to RNA, which is being made from DNA in genes. And that also eventually controls protein expression. And the third mechanism is histone modifications. But for today's presentation, I'm going to focus on the first two types of mechanisms. Now, before we get into the specific aspects of these different epigenetic mechanisms, we have to start at the beginning, which we all learned in our high school days, that the central dogma of molecular biology is that we all carry our genetic information or our blueprint genetic information as in the form of DNA. That DNA is eventually transcribed and made into a message, which is known as RNA. That RNA is eventually translated and made into protein. So different types of proteins are being made in this fashion. And they carry out different functions inside our cells in our bodies. Now, DNA actually is uh, made up of four different nucleotides, or they are known as DNA bases. And they are shown on the left-hand corner here, as you can see, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Their short form, usually they are recognized as A, T, C, G. And as you can see here up on the right hand side corner, they are usually laid out as a sequence in single letter uh, nomenclature. So you can picture these four nucleotides as being the alphabets, the way we have 26 alphabets to make up different words. These four nucleotides make up different types of DNA sequences similar to making up different words. So you could think about DNA as a sequence of code that contains instructions that are required to make all the components which make up uh, different cells in our body. Now, what happens usually is under normal circumstances in a normal cell, in normal healthy human being, you would have DNA that is transcribed into RNA and then to protein. But many times, there could be a change in this DNA sequence. As you can see here, the normal sequence of A, G, this third G, is being changed to A. And this is known as a mutation. Now, once such mutation occurs, that mutation actually gets incorporated into the message being made into RNA, and then subsequently into protein. And depending on the type of mutation, it can actually either affect the protein by either not being made at all, or it will, the protein will be made but will not be able to carry out its normal function. So any kind of change, such as a mutation in a DNA sequence, is a sort of permanent change. Now let's compare that to epigenetic change. So contrary to what happens with a genetic change in mutation, in epigenetic change, there is no change to the DNA sequence. That is, all the instructions or the code remains the same. But there are changes that are being brought about that can actually affect either at how the RNA is being made or how eventually protein is being made. In other words, the efficiency with which these DNA instructions are being carried out can be affected or regulated by epigenetic changes. So, now let's compare genetic changes versus epigenetic changes. 
On the left hand side here you can see the genetic change and we saw that the normal sequence can change to mutated sequence with a G changing to T and that becomes a permanent change in the DNA sequence. So when such sequence change happens inside a cell, any other daughter cells that arise from that parental cell will carry that change and it becomes a permanent change in all the subsequent cells that are being generated. Now let's compare that to epigenetic change. In this case, let's say there is an epigenetic change as addition of this methyl group that you can see. Now by bringing up that methyl group which is attached to the normal sequence, DNA sequence, you can see that there is no change to the normal DNA sequence except there is this attachment that is hanging up above one of the nucleotides. So this kind of epigenetic change isn't a permanent change in the DNA sequence because the influence that is bringing about this epigenetic change or addition of methyl group, if that influence is gone, then that change also can be gone. You can see that the change disappears, brings back the influence from the surrounding environment, the change is back again. So one of the key difference between genetic change versus epigenetic change is genetic change is a permanent change in the DNA sequence, but epigenetic change is actually a reversible change. And that opens up a lot of potential therapeutic opportunities to treat different diseases that have incurred such epigenetic changes. Now let's look at the first type of DNA mecha based mechanism of epigenetic change known as DNA methylation. And what you see here is a, a representative cartoon picture of a gene. So now if we consider the four nucleotides as the alphabets that make up our vocabulary, they actually are put together in different combinations to make up words. That was the DNA sequence that we saw earlier. But ultimately those words have to be put into certain sentences to actually make some sense. And so those sentences you can picture as these units called genes. So what you see up here is a normal gene. And that normal gene usually will have a remote control, a master regulatory switch or control up above as shown here. And usually if that control is properly being administered, then that gene will be expressed it will go from DNA to RNA to go on to make up a specific protein. What happens sometimes when things don't work out that way and they start to become from a normal uh, 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 sequence of events as shown here to abnormal sequence of events as shown in this bottom panel, then these genes, because of addition of this methyl group on their master remote control switch, that remote control is now shut off and the gene expression is shut off or to say the least sometimes it is much more significantly decreased such that the protein is either not being made at all or it is being made at very very low levels. So as you can see DNA methylation can bring about changes in the way the proteins are synthesized or the way the, the genes are expressed. So the second mechanism of epigenetic uh, regulation is small non-coding RNAs and a particular focus today is going to be on microRNAs. So the way this epigenetic mechanism actually is facilitated is by binding to RNA which is that is being made from DNA and eventually it will control protein expression. And you can see that here. So in this case as you can see these microRNAs which are small molecules that are found inside and outside of our cells including biological sources like blood samples or urine samples or even saliva samples and in our cells. And these microRNAs actually will inhibit RNA being made into protein. So in this case they do not affect the DNA sequence but their effect is seen more at the RNA level. But the sum total end effect is the same, which is um, by binding to RNA, they will either uh, stop protein being made or the protein is made at a very, very low level. 
So now let's put both these epigenetic mechanisms together in a larger picture. So as you can see here, using different type of epigenetic mechanisms that either act at DNA level by addition of methyl mark or by introducing binding of microRNA at RNA level, eventually they control gene expression which leads to fine tuning of protein expression as shown here. So what you see here is this is the double helical molecule of DNA. There are some methylation marks as you can see here and that will actually affect how the message is being made into this RNA and that will affect the way the protein is being made or, or expressed. The other mechanism is binding of this microRNA which will also bind to the messenger RNA and uh, through this path or method, the protein assembly is blocked. So what actually causes these epigenetic changes that seem to be so important in regulating the way DNA sequence actually is made or DNA sequence actually is expressed to make different proteins? And so there is fair bit of exciting research that is being going on in this area for the last 10 to 15 years. And as you can see, it sort of is trying to capture various potential risk factors or different changes that can be seen in and around our surrounding environment as well as based on our daily lifestyle. So for example, there could be different types of diet that can influence epigenetic changes. There would be seasonal changes, exposure to sunlight or lack of sunlight. There could be exposure to diseases through exposure to different type of viruses or bacteria. There could be also lifestyle related choices such as smoking or drug abuse. What's more important is there is also a potential beneficial effect of exercise. And there are some exploratory interesting area of research that is also looking at any kind of relationship between socioeconomic status as well as its effect on epigenetic modulation. So as you can see here, there are a wide range of epigenetic uh, environmental factors that will affect the epigenetic changes and these epigenetic changes will ultimately affect how the genes are being expressed. And so there was a very interesting um, um, observation which is uh, one of the landmark studies that actually linked the effect of epigenetics not only in the current generation but to show that epigenetic changes can affect over multiple generations. In other words, epigenetic changes can be heritable. And this actually was uh, shown by looking at uh, people who had suffered through Dutch famine of 1944. This was during Second World War. And this is famously known as Dutch hunger winter or hunger winter uh, in English. And this was because of a famine that took place during winter months in, um, Ger uh, because of German occupation of certain parts of Netherlands. And during winter months there was scarcity of food and uh, German occupation uh, did not allow extra food to be brought in. And as a result people only could have about 30 percent of their overall daily ration to actually subsist on. Now what was interesting is when children were born during that famine period, they were observed to be smaller in size than the average size that is seen for Dutch babies. Now that could be of course linked to not having appropriate diet for the pregnant women or their mothers during those famine months. But what was interesting is that effect of having smaller babies actually persisted up to two generations. In other words, not only the mother shown here had poor diet that affected baby's growth, but that baby carrying germ cell inside, inside the womb, inside the fetus also affected the subsequent grand uh, children's generation with respect to the overall size. So these effects were eventually linked due to changes in the methylation status which is linked to poor diet. And so this was one of the first definitive support that showed that epigenetic changes not only can be influenced by environmental factors, but they can also be carried on from one generation to next. And so let's look at uh, now relationship between epigenetics and genetics. 
you may have heard multiple times that there are debates going on about nature versus nurture or in this case I am equating epigenetics with nurture and genetics with nature. So as you can see here on the right hand side picture of the twins Scott and Mark Kelly, uh, two famous astronauts and really the environment that they are exposed to are likely to bring upon differences apart from one has mustache that's Mark Kelly and Scott Kelly who is currently in space orbiting does not have mustache at this point but those are just superficial um, expression. Um, in terms of how the differences in their environment are likely to contribute to this dogma, there are experiments being carried out while Mark is here on earth, uh, blood samples are being taken from both these uh, brothers and the real concept that is being addressed through these studies is how nurture that is epigenetics and other environment is likely to affect nature. So there are some exciting and potentially very revealing findings that are likely to come out of such studies. So what I have discussed so far is that epigenetics is the study of reversible heritable mechanisms that regulate gene expression. One of the key components is they do not alter the basic DNA sequence but epigenetic marks have a major advantage and that is they can be potentially reversible, they can be heritable but they can also be detected in tissue samples and bodily fluids like urine or stool samples or blood samples or saliva samples and therefore such detection of epigenetic marks or analysis of such epigenetic changes actually are um, a potential foundation to serve as attractive biomarkers to study different types of disease states including prostate cancer. Now before we go into bio, uh, prostate cancer area and its um, uh, implication for these epigenetic biomarkers for prostate cancer, I would like to take a little bit of time to focus on what is meant by a biomarker. So biomarker is a biological feature that can be measured be it in a tissue or a biological sample. The key other unique characteristic that biomarkers must uh, have or they are required to have is their ability to distinguish between normal state or a normal cell versus disease state. And so with that in mind there are many different potential opportunities where you can actually develop biomarkers. They could be used to for early detection of uh, any type of disease or they could be used to serve as uh, more accurate diagnostic measures. They can also be used to try and determine which uh, type of patients are likely to uh, produce or uh, go on to develop more se severe or aggressive disease. They can also be used to detect a particular type of response to treatment. Some patients respond favorably, others don't and biomarkers could be developed to address those areas. And then finally after offering the treatment to overall monitor whether the disease will still come back or not, the biomarkers can also serve a very important role or critical role to both monitor not only under disease states but also like recurrence but also to monitor overall normal uh, healthy status. For an ideal biomarker in addition to those two critical characteristic features they are required to have expression that is significantly increased so that you can detect the increase in their expression or changes in their levels yeah, and you can have a correlation between that increased level with respect to the disease condition. They should also show uh, an interesting uh, correlation or very specific correlation with the outcome, disease outcome or treatment outcome or with respect to progression of disease. What's important is they should be fairly readily and easily quantifiable or to, can be measured in accessible biological fluids or clinical samples. And finally before they can be implemented in clinical setting they have to be economical, they have to be the types of biomarkers that can be detected or determined rather in a fairly quick or easy type of test and they should show consistent reliable results. With that I would like to now focus on prostate cancer. 
So these are the 2015 uh, Canadian prostate cancer statistics from Prostate Cancer Canada. And as you can see, prostate cancer is among one of the most common cancers that affect Canadian men. It's the second to the skin cancer uh, in terms of its overall frequency that is likely to be seen among Canadian population. As you can see, one in eight uh, Canadian men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. So the frequency of diagnosis of prostate cancer is fairly high. But there is also, despite such a high estimate, such as 24,000 estimated Canadian men will likely be diagnosed with prostate cancer per year, a good news is that relatively much less proportion of such prostate cancer patients are likely to succumb to this disease. And this is because of uh, improving testing for prostate cancer and also continuously improving better treatment options that are being uh, implemented in clinical settings for prostate cancer. So there is a lot of hope in terms of despite very high frequency of diagnosis that we want to aim and try and target the group of men that are likely to succumb to disease and how we can do specific treatments or develop specific biomarkers to identify such people ahead of time before the disease takes a severe turn. Now, there are some unique features about prostate cancer. What you see here on the right hand side is a prostate uh, that was actually surgically resected or taken out of a patient. And this prostate cancer tumor was stained so that you could see different types of cells that are shown here. And as you can see, there isn't just one single tumor, but you can see that there are multiple different tumor foci that are seen in this one single prostate cancer uh, or prostate tumor that was resected from a prostate cancer patient. So one of the uh, characteristic feature of prostate cancer is it is a highly heterogeneous disease and within a given prostate gland that you see here, there could be multiple different foci of disease. In other words, tumors can grow in separate regions independent of each other and that sometimes can pose uh, certain problems with respect to doing accurate diagnosis in terms of how the tumor will behave or what kind of proper treatment should be offered to such patients. So broadly speaking, you can look at the majority of prostate tumors tend to be slow growing and they are called indolent, but a small but definite subset of patients will have these aggressive type of prostate tumors. Now usually prostate uh, cancer is diagnosed by uh, on biopsy. So a small piece of prostate tissue is obtained by needle biopsy. And then a pathologist will stain that tissue and look at it under microscope at different types of cellular structure to determine how the diagnosis is being made for either low risk prostate cancer or high risk prostate cancer. And this system was devised by a pathologist from Mayo Clinic. His name was Dr. Gleason. So it's called as uh, uh, Gleason score in honor of recognizing his contribution. Now, um, in terms of uh, in terms of looking at how this score is actually decided, Gleason score is some of the two patterns. You can see there are five different patterns that are shown underneath here, and they can actually go through degree of being more severe or more aggressive, or uh, uh, in other words, more aggressive forms of cancer. And so it is the sum of two different patterns that are seen here. And when they are added, if the total score of two different patterns is Gleason score six or less, then generally it's considered to be a low grade or less risky or low risk prostate cancer, which can be in more considered as indolent prostate cancer. Gleason score seven is the intermediate risk and Gleason score eight or more is high risk prostate cancer. So currently there are three broad methods or ways by which prostate cancer patients are screened for potential diagnosis of prostate cancer and eventually the diagnosis is confirmed. So the first and foremost is by checking for prostate specific antigen or PSA levels by taking a blood sample and measuring this particular uh, blood marker in a laboratory based testing. 
Now, this is not a confirmatory diagnostic test. It actually is a very good screening tool so that you can now consider somebody who has increased level of PSA is likely to be um, considered as potentially to harbor prostate cancer, but that needs to be confirmed further by biopsy. The second is digital rectal exam, which can look for any kind of enlargement or abnormalities of prostate cancer that can be felt by this examination. And the third is, of course, by doing the prostate cancer biopsy and looking at the biopsy or reviewing it with a pathologic examination, as I was uh, talking about in the previous slide. So the current overall screening methods are indeed effective, but they have limitations. And the limitations are they can often be um, not uh, specifically accurate to identify or discriminate between indolent versus aggressive prostate cancer. So in other words, sometimes if patients are diagnosed by PSA screening test, digital rectal examination, and biopsy. So many of these patients may harbor low risk or indolent cancer, but they might likely incur more aggressive treatment, or in some cases, treatment that can be avoided or delayed for some time. As opposed to sometimes, there is also a risk, unfortunately, of underdiagnosing patients who have a more occult, that is hidden, aggressive cancer. So, the issues that I was talking about are again shown here. Issues with PSA testing is sometimes high PSA levels can also occur due to inflammation of prostate gland. Sometimes the early diagnosis is really uh, very good. Uh, it is a good tool to do early diagnosis, but it cannot distinguish between low risk, slow growing versus high risk cancer. And at the same time, there is a subset of men who may have clinically significant cancer, but for some reason their PSA does not increase in when their blood tests are performed. And such people are then missed out on their initial diagnosis. So pathology diagnosis by biopsy is the real confirmation diagnosis, but it has also certain limitations, such as the Gleason score on biopsy sometimes can be inaccurate because there could be multiple different tumor foci that could be sometimes more aggressive than the one that a pathologist is uh, examining under a bias, under a microscope. And at the same time, some tumors with the same Gleason score uh, may have fast growing or slow growing uh, cancers. And you can see here, because of these uh, limitations or current challenges, there is really a need for new, more effective prostate cancer biomarkers. Biomarkers that can be measured in biological specimens obtained from such patients with a goal to improve diagnostic accuracy and also to improve uh, uh, the, the assessment of aggressive versus lethal prostate cancer. And what I have tried to show here is from a localized prostate cancer that looks the same under a microscope, it may be in majority of cases indolent cancer. And you can see here Robert De Niro who was uh, the Hollywood actor who was diagnosed with prostate cancer and was treated in 2003 and he's doing very well uh, even as of 2016 and he is uh, uh, very uh, lucky and fortunate and also it is an encouraging story for a lot of people with appropriate and accurate diagnosis and treatment that they can really carry on with life. Unfortunately, that was not the case with late Jack Layton whose cancer turned out to be much more aggressive and he ultimately succumbed to the metastasis of prostate cancer. In order to avoid over-treatment of patients that would fall into more of the majority of cases, which is slow-growing prostate cancer or indolent prostate cancer, um, there are new methods that are being now implemented in clinical settings to monitor such patients. And these are known as active surveillance um, uh, strategies. So for active surveillance, which is intended to manage these low-risk prostate cancer patients, the goal is to reduce over-treatment. And in this case, patients are usually brought into clinic uh, and their PSA is measured in blood for every three to six months. They are given digital rectal exam. And then a biopsy is performed on their prostate to monitor for their prostate cancer every one to three years, depending on their PSA levels. Now, if there are any kind of signs of tumor progression, then of course the patients are treated, but this way they can avoid unnecessary early treatment, which can be 
put on hold until such tumor progression signs are seen and that may take sometimes many years. Biopsies are still quite invasive though and so the focus now is to, uh, to really develop minimally invasive methods or strategies to obtain samples like urine samples for example to monitor such active surveillance patients. And ultimately all of this can be improved further if we can develop biomarkers that can be detected in urine then that would become a very desirable strategy that can be implemented in clinical setting. So epigenetic changes are emerging class of promising cancer biomarkers for a variety of reasons. They provide a very stable signal and importantly they produce a tumor specific signal. Um, so the changes in epigenetic uh, methylation or microRNAs can be seen to occur more in cancer cells when compared to normal cells. They can be detected in different types of biological sources. So if a prostate cancer tumor is obtained after surgery, that this would serve as a fresh or frozen tissue sample that can be used to detect such epigenetic changes. They can also be seen in samples that were op uh, obtained from patients who were operated maybe even few years ago. Such samples are usually stored as archival specimen in pathology departments of various centers. And such samples can also be used to detect these epigenetic changes. They can be detected in needle biopsies which only allow you to take a very, very small piece of tissue or urine or plasma samples. And for other types of cancers like lung cancers, they can also be seen in saliva samples. So here I have tried to put a sort of a little snapshot of the potential areas where epigenetic biomarkers that could be unique methylation changes or microRNA changes that can be combined to form a unique signature which can have potential to serve as biomarkers for early detection as shown here. They could be used to determine prognosis, so whether they can be aggressive versus indolent or whether the aggressive prostate cancer is likely to become metastatic or stay as castration resistant prostate cancer. They can also be developed to determine response to therapy as shown here. And so with these areas that need specific attention to develop better type of markers and with our interest in the cancer genetics and epigenetics areas of research, these are some of the questions that my research team is interested in addressing. We want to ask three uh, fairly simple questions. Uh, but that would lead to hopefully potentially very profound and promising answers. What are the epigenetic and genetic changes that control normal and cancer cells in our bodies? How can we explore these changes to find new biomarkers, which I would call as discovering new biomarkers? How can we select the most efficient biomarkers, which would be confirming or validating these biomarkers in multiple different patient series or patient sets? And our ultimate goal is to develop molecular tests that can be uh, utilize, uh, utilizing these biomarkers that can be used in clinical setting to improve patient care based on investigation of these questions. So in this slide, what I'm trying to show you is one of the cutting edge technology uh, uh, strategy that we and other investigators around globe have adopted to try and answer such questions. So let's start with identifying different stages of prostate cancer for which biomarkers are needed. Currently we are focusing on the early stage of prostate cancer. We want to develop or identify biomarkers that will help us to determine upfront which patients are likely to develop aggressive cancer and then target those patients for specific therapies. Then once you identify the particular disease stage, you would want to go on to actually identify specific genes that carry such epigenetic changes. And we uh, perform different type of strategies using uh, fairly cutting edge technologies such as DNA sequencing and microarray based platforms to detect these DNA methylation changes or microRNAs that are specifically, specifically seen in cancer cells or prostate tumors. Now once we identify such list of top candidate genes among a pool of 20,000 or so genes that we carry in our genome, then we want to try and narrow down this list 
to the most promising candidate genes. In order to do that, we perform some other confirmatory tests to make sure that we have really identified the right kind of potential biomarkers. And ultimately, we confirm or evaluate these promising biomarkers in independent patient cohorts for additional validation or confirmation of these biomarkers. Another focus in our research is uh, also to try and utilize minimally invasive strategies such as obtaining urine samples from prostate cancer patients or obtaining less invasive strategies than biopsies such as blood samples. We also like to use biopsy samples because biopsy, if you could use to try and avoid um, indolent patients having to go through radical prostatectomy or remove prostate by surgery, then that would be largely beneficial for such patients to be recruited into active surveillance type of studies. And then using material obtained as either tissue or blood samples or urine samples, we then screen for identifying different biomarkers. And so again, just a reminder, this is the gene cartoon that we looked at before. This is the normal cell where genes are expressed. When there is methylation, methylation marks will shut down the gene expression. So the more the methylation marks, they increase in their uh, expression, then less is the gene being expressed in cancer cells. In other words, methyl marks are usually increased in cancer cells, and that becomes a tool to try and detect such marks. And so here is one such prototype example. What you can see here is a genome-wide investigation of DNA methylation that we performed on prostate cancer patients. Um, here at the bottom, you see a small glass slide. And what you see here is known as a microarray uh, um, chip. On this are these little dots. And those dots actually represent uh, different pieces of different genes. Our genome carries somewhere about 20 to 22,000 genes. And there are representative pieces of those genes with certain methylation marks that are actually seen here. Once you obtain samples from different sources, as I described before, then those samples are allowed to actually bind to these marks. So if a patient's sample has more methylation, then it will light up as the red signal, as you see here, because there is a fluorescent label that will, it's almost equivalent to glow in the dark type of fluorescence. And if there is less, less methylation, then you can see here, it will be shown as green marks. So this is a representation of such a study. What you see here, each lane represents one patient sample. These are normal, healthy individuals. And you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six different normal individuals DNA that is being uh, screened or analyzed for their methylation marks. As opposed to, there are about 12 to 13 prostate cancer patient samples, again, each individual row here that you can see. And one snapshot look at this can tell you that there are distinct differences. There is more red marks that are seen in most of these prostate cancer patients, and that indicates specific type of genes that carry those marks. So this is the list of those top 1,000 such differentially methylated genes that we identified using this kind of strategy. And now we focused on trying to show their association with either high-risk prostate cancer versus also which one of these prostate cancer patients are likely to show a recurrence of disease by either increasing PSA or by progressing further to metastasis. Now, as I mentioned before, that that is a very efficient or effective method to identify those patients that are likely to go on to develop aggressive disease. But majority of patients are likely to still harbor more indolent disease. And so with that in mind, in collaboration with patients that were recruited prostate cancer patients from Sunnybrook Hospital and also from University Health Network, we carried out first Canadian study, which was funded by Prostate Cancer Canada to examine urinary DNA methylation biomarkers. 
in prostate cancer patients that are currently undergoing this active surveillance program for monitoring their disease. And we were able to detect methylation biomarkers in urine samples of these patients and we showed that among the markers that we had identified based on our tissue-based strategy, there were four specific methylation markers that showed a significant association or correlation for predicting which one of those patients are likely to go on to develop aggressive tumors. Now, this is the first identification of such markers. What's required is now to confirm this kind of observation from recruiting different types of patient cohorts. The other component, again, to remind ourselves among epigenetic mechanisms is this microRNA-based changes. And so for microRNA-based changes, which also control gene expression, we are performing similar type of studies looking at microRNA that are, again, being expressed in these patients using their urine samples. And as you can see here, again, there are two types of clusters or groups of patients. There are patients that are shown here as one cluster, and there are patients that are shown as, um, as being um, um, differentiated between normal patients who carry different types of methylation or less amount of methylation compared to patients who carry more aggressive type of methylation or uh, which are likely to develop aggressive tumors. Um, now, in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about a very exciting study that is funded as a prostate cancer uh, Movember jointly funded translation acceleration grant. And that is involving multiple different centers, both here in Canada as well as internationally. And the, this is the study that uh, would actually focus on moving our observations beyond discovery space to try and validate an integrated biomarker panel that will incorporate both methylation and microRNA biomarkers to detect aggressive prostate cancer. So in this particular study, which we initiated last year, there are several different unique strengths. We are accessing fairly large set of patients in the neighborhood of about 1,800 or so patients that are recruited from different centers in Canada, Finland, Ireland, and United Kingdom. We will examine archival prostate tumor samples and biopsy samples that are obtained from these patients for these specific methylation markers and microRNA biomarkers. We will also use non-invasive methods to obtain urine samples and blood samples from these patients to perform a similar type of assessment of different type of methylation and microRNA changes that are likely to show promise or potential as associated with either early diagnosis or more accurate prognosis as well as prediction. Our overall vision for at the end of this project is to develop a biomarker signatures of uh, unique characteristics that will help with optimal detection and management of aggressive prostate cancer. And some of these studies are also being uh, carried on in collaboration with other larger such global initiatives. And many such initiatives are being uh, identified under um, Movember funded initiative called Global Action Plan. And through that stream, we are also recruiting additional patient cohorts. And so with that, I would like to summarize what I um, covered in today's webinar is actually what is the role of epigenetics and what kind of significant contributions epigenetics is likely to make in regulating both the normal versus disease state, or in other words, maintaining normal healthy state as well as trying to minimize exposure and or trying to minimize transition to different types of disease states prostate cancer being one of them. Um, how environment can influence such epigenetic changes, and furthermore, how fine tuning of gene expression can be brought about by such epigenetic mechanisms. I discussed briefly about some of the current ongoing projects that we are looking at to discover such methylation and microRNA biomarkers, 
and how some of these biomarkers we have actually identified initially in tumor samples, but now we have also further pushed that to another level to detect them in urine samples from prostate cancer patients. And our current focus for the current and foreseeable future is to try and establish the validity of these biomarkers by screening their association for similar type of disease states in multiple different international and national patient cohorts. Now with that, I would like to acknowledge that this work could not have been done without training the next uh, generation of prostate cancer researchers in Canada. Some of those are shown here, where they all donned along with me, plaid for dad to celebrate uh, Prostate Cancer Canada's uh, uh, day last year. And of course, such work cannot be done uh, with, without a very key critical collaborations. Well, and I'm very fortunate to be able to do that along with multiple such collaborators, clinicians, and scientists from different centers, both in Canada as well as internationally. And with that, I would like to stop. And I would like to once again thank Prostate Cancer Canada to, for the opportunity to share some of the work that we are carrying on in this exciting field. And I think I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Papad. Before we take any questions, and just a reminder to please use the chat box on your screen to do this, we would like to do a quick poll to see how many people were participating in today's webinar. I'll just give everyone a few seconds to do this. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Papad, our first question is about how much of an influence can diet and other modifiable factors that impact epigenetics have on preventing prostate cancer? So that's a, a really good question. Uh, diet plays a, a major role in terms of uh, regulating some of the changes. And uh, we all know that it goes beyond even prostate cancer, but uh, health uh, overall. Um, many times diets that are rich in uh, fat or some other type of meat can have some increased risk for cancer in general. With respect to prostate cancer, uh, lycopene, which is an ingredient in tomato that has been shown to have beneficial effects for reducing some risk of prostate cancer. Now, diet and epigenetic link is really interesting because depending on diet that is rich in certain type of ingredients, will help to monitor methylation. And uh, methylation changes that are being maintained at a low level in normal cells is very beneficial. So diets that are rich in uh, cruciferous vegetables, also fruits, and a uh, lot less in eating meat products that are sort of processed meats are always desirable. Thank you. Our next question is about the biomarker research. Can you summarize what this means for patients now and what it might mean for patients in five to ten years? Um, certainly. Um, so um, there are actually some biomarkers that are already currently um, being in the development at a much advanced stage than what I described. Uh, some of those markers are fairly close to be implied, uh, implemented in clinical uh, settings. Uh, there are a couple of such tests that I'll talk about. One of them is called Confirm MDX that looks at uh, methylation of three different gene marker panels. And um, that is being offered by the company MDX, uh, whereby patients who undergo biopsy, and sometimes if the biopsy comes negative, but patients still uh, have presented with high levels of PSA then performing such a test to look for methylation of the genes can help a clinician to determine if the patient should be brought in immediately for a subsequent biopsy. So some tests are actually being implemented in clinic as we speak. Some other tests are also fairly close uh, to being implemented. There are certain copy number variation or gene signatures that are actually coming out of certain Canadian uh, studies, such as CPC gene study. 
There are some other biomarkers that are also being implemented. One such test is looking for PCA3 that can help with early diagnosis. But right now, we don't need more markers that are going to be um, uh, allowing early diagnosis. It should be more about focusing on trying to identify that subset of patients who, once diagnosed, we can identify upfront that are going to develop more aggressive disease. Thank you. Our next question is, a, is about the environmental and epigenetics asking, what is there any environmental factor that has been found to have the most impact on epigenetics and prostate cancer? There isn't really just one particular uh, uh, factor that you can say is uh, conclusively linked. And partly it's because as you can imagine, when we subject ourselves on a daily basis, there are so many different influences that come through environment. Um, also, prostate tumors tend to be quite heterogeneous in nature, so it wouldn't be down to just one specific uh, factor. Having said that, um, you can put down um, a, a, a good diet, definitely exercise, that has been shown to be beneficial for, for reducing risk of prostate cancer or even progression of prostate cancer, along with minimizing some other lifestyle-related choices such as smoking or uh, excessive alcohol consumption. Those are likely to contribute, although the conclusive link has been shown more so with diet and epigenetic changes at this point. Thank you. And our last question is if patients or folks on the line want to have more information about the research you've already conducted or updates on your current projects as they move forward, what's the best place for them to find that information? Um, well, I would, I would consider since these studies have been funded by Prostate Cancer Canada, there would be some updates that would be provided through that mechanism. But uh, if they would like to know more about this, I would be happy to uh, answer the questions in to my best ability um, the way I can. I wanted to put a disclaimer, which I should have done at the beginning, which is I'm not a clinician. I'm a basic scientist. However, I do work with a lot of clinicians, so I could certainly um, you know, clinically relevant questions can be addressed by other members of my team. Thank you very much, Brati, for providing information on such an important topic this evening. Thank you, too, to the participants for your questions and comments and, being, and for being so engaged in this dialogue. I also wanted to gratefully acknowledge the support of our sponsors, Abby, Estellis, and Jansen, who make this webinar series possible. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, February 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time with Christy Brissett and Sarah Buchanan on the topic of using diet to manage prostate cancer treatment side effects. As always, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in the coming days. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO. That's 1-855-722-4636 or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. Thank you everyone so much for being a part of tonight's webinar and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.